there. Welcome to Mushroom Hour. Today on Mushroom Hour, we have the fortuitous occasion to interview Michael Campbell. Michael is a sculptural artist based in the San Francisco Bay Area, whose work explores our connection to the mysterious fungi kingdom. His fascination with mushrooms has seen him create amazing works of art that blend Western religious iconography with stunningly realistic fungi sculptures and elements of the natural world. The inspiration from Kingdom Fungi goes beyond art, as Michael also explores how mushrooms can be a lens through which to explore those vast realms of death and spirituality. Michael's work has been inoculating the world of fine art and is shown in galleries from San Francisco to Los Angeles. I was lucky enough to meet Michael when his studio was based downtown in San Rafael, where I live. And after seeing his mind-blowing artwork and having a conversation with this wizard of occult mystery, I realized I had found a kindred spirit in mushrooms. Michael, it's an honor to have you on the show. Thank you very much. Now, I just gave you quite the introduction, and we are going to talk about, I mean, you are a wizard, and we are going to talk about some extremely lofty themes uh, in the context of your work and really your life, uh, and how you've kind of come to grips with some really big philosophical and spiritual topics through mushrooms. It's going to get heavy. It's going to get heavy. Well... <laughs> I'm I'm here for it. I'm here for it. I'm here to get serious with mushrooms and look at the bigger picture and the bigger issues. And that's what it's all about. But why don't we start before we get big? Why don't we start small in the microcosm of MC's life uh, growing up and really kind of how you got into art and then maybe how you got into mushrooms. But you're from Kansas. Yes. So you grew yeah. up in Kansas, which if people have seen Michael, he looks super edgy as a huge beard just looks like this artsy guy it's like i would not place you in kansas so tell us a little bit about growing up in kansas and kind of how that influenced you um i spent my first 26 years of life in kansas sort of northeastern part of the state and i was i, I love kansas and i love the people there they're very genuine um good people but i was always kind of an outsider and always an oddball there so when I turned 26, I started going west, went to Tucson, Arizona to grad school to study sculpture, and then finished that up and then kept going west again and went as far as I could go and went to the Bay Area and found my freak show. <laughs> well, you did, you did find your home, your community of, of freaks and community of mushroom heads. I mean, it's funny you ended up out here where we have such a vibrant mushroom community, the perfect place for an artist whose subject is mushrooms. Uh, now, the obsession with art in general, and especially sculpture, I'm, I'm guessing that had been there since a child, or did that kind of develop when you were in school? Or Yeah, I've, I've made art from practically day one. I mean, I was always drawing, I was always making things as a kid. Um, I grew up an only child, so I spent a lot of my time alone um, in you know, just playing in my room and, and um, it really fed my imagination. So it's, that's, I'm very comfortable being alone, working in the studio. Studio time is like a meditation for me. Mm -hmm. um, it's alone with my thoughts and building things at the same time. I will say it is interesting when you, someone like you who is a professional artist the amount of work and time and investment that goes into it uh, is really mind boggling from someone on the outside looking in. You have these romantic notions of what it's like to have an art studio and be an artist and it's all fun. And, you know, sometimes you're pushing yourself to get in the studio when you don't really want to be in the studio. <laughs> never. <laughs> okay. Okay. That's studio true. Time is, studio time is always good time. There's never a bad day in studio, honestly. Oh, I love it. All right. That's awesome. So, so as we hear about your obsession with mushrooms, then you have this magical mystery tour leading you through Arizona and out <laughs> west. When did you catch the bug for mushrooms? Is when you look at your art, it's obvious that you are obsessed with mushrooms. Like you have spores in your brain, inoculating your brain and making your hands produce these amazing mushrooms. So when when did that 
really start? How did that start? Well, I'd say it's probably two part. Um, to the interest in mycology and really looking at different types of mushrooms and searching for them, hunting them down. Um, that happened in the past um, 10 years or so, living um, in North Bay. Um, oh, okay. Mushroom hunting in North Bay is is amazing. But um, the beginning of mushrooms, interest in mushrooms would have been in college and doing psychedelics. Oh, okay. So that's a common story. That's how so many people I know in the mushroom community got started, was you take psychedelic mushrooms. You have extremely potent consciousness changing effects, almost always beneficial or almost always positive experiences from what I've heard. And people usually come out the other side different. And it sounds like in your case, you know, it was that kind of transcendent positive experience that set your trajectory, at least directed you even more toward mushrooms in the world of mycology. Yeah, usually. I mean, it, um, the experiences on psychedelics and it, it varies. Um, I mean, sometimes it's, it's euphoric um, and it really opens you up. And then other times it's really challenging. I've had, I've had some, I've had some really challenging experiences where I set things aside for 20 years and said, I don't need, I don't need to touch this for a while. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, and you know, I should put that disclaimer. Most people who follow me know that I'm not the poster child for psychedelics. I don't get into psychedelic mushrooms a ton, but it is a huge and really a fascinating topic. And it's a huge topic on the minds of everyone pretty much in our culture right now as it gets more and more popularized as it, there's more clinical studies going through it i've done shows on it um but i don't want to sound like i'm telling people like hey it's always a positive experience it's just go do it so thank you for tempering that a little bit with hey it's not always positive <laughs> not at all and it's not for everyone um yeah. i would you know i my attitude towards entheogenic mushrooms is it's one of reverence um it's not something you take and go to a party mm. uh, it's hard work usually it's it's challenging you know it's it opens you up it causes you to consider things you wouldn't have considered it changes your perspective um but it's not easy for sure and, and i would also say that if you have listeners who are searching for antheogenic mushrooms psilocybin you have to be very, very careful about what you pick because there are lookalikes out there that will kill you. Yeah. One that comes to mind is, and I'm forgetting the exact name right now, but it's a variety of gallerina mushroom. Um, and some people say it doesn't look much like it, but I know to a beginner, there's the certain type of gallerina that grows on like wood mulch and decaying wood that kind of looks like a uh, psilocybe cyanescens. And I, I have seen people, I've been with people on forages and they get those two confused. So yes, don't just go out and assume that, you know, another one is Liberty Caps, that you know what it looks like and that's definitely it. Like there's so much variation. Don't just go out there and, and start digging around thinking you're, you found your psychedelic mushroom and pop it in your mouth. That's, I mean, that, that goes without saying that's a disclaimer for any mushroom, but for psychedelics, <laughs> especially, thank you for, for making that disclaimer. Uh, now, mm -hmm. For you, I mean, we're talking about like perception shattering, opening up your mind, we're talking about opening up your heart in a big way. When was your first experience and how did those effects we're talking about, assuming the first experience was a good one, how did those effects that we're talking about change some of your outlook on life? Sure. Yeah. My first experience with mushrooms was back in Kansas and I went to a friend's farm. So we were way out in the country you know, far beyond you know, any activity from people that would have interfered with it. Right. And he was my mentor. He, he was sort of the trip, um, uh, you know, babysitter, mm -hmm. trip sitter, I guess you'd say, um, and int introduced me to the mushrooms. And I mean, it was, it was really eye opening. you know, you know, all the eyes um, were open from that. Third eye wide open. Yeah. And I would say that, you know, it's so growing up in Kansas, I grew up in a Protestant based religion. We went to church on Sundays. We went to Sunday school. I went to church camp. You know, I did all of that stuff. And I never really, never really felt the presence of some kind of all father or godlike figure going to that church. But I found that in nature, you know, through 
an experience with entheogens through psychedelics. Um, you connect to the natural world in ways that you just you can't do ordinarily. Yeah. Well, and I think that's something that people always come away with is that greater connection to all that is and the greater sense of a unifying force amongst all creation that gets talked about in a lot of religious texts. People really feel it for their first times when they when they have um, psilocybin containing mushrooms. At least that's what I'm seeing in a lot of anecdotal reports, even a lot of clinical research. That's one of the main takeaways people have. And it's interesting in a culture that's more and more divorced from institutionalized religion that people are, are uh, excited about the prospect of having that experience. I mean, that's something that's, you know, th this, can, this spiritual connection that we all really need to nurture our being is something that people are hungry for. So the idea that these mushrooms can provide that is hugely intriguing to people and hugely appealing to people. And, you know, it's interesting juxta juxtaposing your Kansas upbringing in a highly religious environment with your experience using psilocybin containing mushrooms and how you kind of got what you were supposed to get out of the religious experience from the mushrooms. Now that's not to say that's everyone's experience. And I think it helped probably that you were in an area where you weren't around a ton of people where you had kind of space to integrate the experience and also that you were doing it with someone that you trusted. Uh, and this is something I, I had the, opportunity to speak with a Johns Hopkins researcher. And, you know, without you knowing it, that's their best practices. You need to really know the person you're doing it with. Um, you need to have an experience that really isn't hyperactive. There's not a lot of stimuli inputs. And then you have to have some space afterwards to integrate the experience to really have a better chance at some of those beneficial outcomes we're talking about, like the emotional and spiritual outcomes. And I just want to read a really poetic verse that I pulled from an article about you that I thought put it into words better than my whole jumble of what I just threw out there. <clears throat> and again, this is coming from you. I'm interested in our perception of the eternal, the divine, and the otherworldly through objects that bring about an alternate mythological narrative spoken through the voice of nature. This narrative suggests, counter to Judeo-Christian teaching, that we are all connected to the natural world and its ecosystem. A new earth-centered liturgy is offered by saintly objects and altars that seem to grow from the forest floor. So that's a beautiful way to put together the concepts that we're talking about and also leads me to thinking about all the different ways that our current Judeo-Christian myths may be based in no small part around, around mushrooms. Uh, now, this is something I love as someone who loves, you know, alternative histories. So to think that a lot of our modern religious mythos or stories could have their roots in mushrooms is really, really exciting. Yeah, exactly. It's and there's a lot of literature out there that suggests there's a lot of stuff online you can read about. Um, whether it's you know whether it's true or not, you know I don't know. But one example is um, um, John Allegro, who wrote um, the Sacred Mushroom and the Cross back in the seventies. Yes. Um, and that is a that's a strange book. Very strange. <laughs> it, it's it's basically suggesting that Christ was a mushroom. Um, Christ was an entheogenic mushroom. Um, there's that example. There's also there's um, a fresco in somewhere in France. Um, and it's in the my French is not good, but the Plan Corot um, Chapel. And there's a fresco mm -hmm. inside. It looks like Adam and Eve pulling the forbidden fruit, and the forbidden fruit looks like um, the red and white Amanita muscaria. Oh wow. Wow. Well, and even I, I was reading about, you know, some hieroglyphs they've been finding in Egypt that are just adorned with mushrooms and they may have grown psychoactive mushrooms on uh, barley. So barley was their substrate to grow psychoactive mushrooms. So it's just really interesting to think that a lot of the mythos that we have in modern religions could be born at least in some part 
out of a reverence for mushrooms that for some reason had to be veiled, whether it's by the institutions that didn't want people knowing that mushrooms may have been at the heart of this or didn't want the layman to have access necessarily to some of these transcendental states they keep talking about, but don't really say how to reach. So they don't want you to know about the mushrooms that might do that. Um, but even if, even if, like you said, those stories aren't necessarily 100% accurate, they're more fun, they're more entertainment, the analogs are undeniable, especially when you talk about a nature as giving you this religious, spiritual experience. I mean, I've talked about that so much on the show because that's what it's done for me. Even if it's not specifically playing into an exact Judeo-Christian mythos or anything like that, it's undeniable that the mushrooms give you a connection with spirituality that religion is only attempting to. So nature is kind of the, the first religion and appreciation of nature is really the first religion. Exactly. Yeah. And there's a, and there's a, a quote from um, a Gnostic text from the gospel of Thomas. And it's, it talks about um, the kingdom of the father coming. And the, the quote says it's Jesus said, um, it will not come by waiting for it. It will not be a matter of saying, here it is, or there it is. Rather, the kingdom of the Father is spread out upon the earth, and men do not see it. Wow. It's right under our feet. Yeah, it's here we are. You know, it's, it's, not, it's not out there. It's, we're here. This is it. Well, and I've gotten feedback from people that, you know, this is almost kind of a pagan ideology, uh, this idea of the worship of the physical nature as the connection to the divine. And for me, I just, I can't really turn it into a negative thing. Like I can't, you know, I, I like the idea that we've made the divine more tangibly appreciable in the fact that it is nature. It is mushrooms. I mean, these are things that connect us to the most divine aspects of this universe. You know, it's, it's something that I think has come with a lot of institutional religious programmings that the divine is somewhere else. It's way up in the sky. It's far away from you. And for me, it's really helped my, I mean, mental, emotional, and spiritual health to find the divine in the nature all around us. And, you know, it, and I think that your work kind of plays with those ideas is what I want to say. Uh, because people who may not be familiar with your work, you use a lot of Judeo-Christian iconography. Yeah, I'll, t I'll take um, um, specifically Catholic statues and turn the figures into mushrooms. I mean, I, I see mushrooms as these anthropomorphic figures. They're, they're a great example of um, how short life is, how ephemeral mm. life is. You know, they pop up out of the ground mysteriously sort of overnight you know a good rain and, and a good cold snap and there the mushrooms are and then within a day or two they fade they wrinkle they shrink um you know just like humans do in a way our, our faces our skin shrinks and wrinkles and it's a mo it's a mo model or a paradigm for what we are the way we live that's really interesting to think about to think about mushrooms is almost a, an accelerated model of a human life and actually, right before the show, too, we were talking about some interesting ways and in that the mushroom parts mimic a human. Absolutely. I mean, everyone can see the mushroom as a phallic symbol. It's, it has that, that phallus shape to it as it pops out of the ground. Right. But then to look more closely at it, to really study them, when, when the gills open, there's a sense of something feminine, something almost vaginal about the gills. And then within the names, within the nomenclature, the, the universal veil that covers the gills, that drops and opens and allows the spores to, to drop into the world. Um, the universal veil has this feminine quality to it as well. So there's something androgynous and something that represents humanity in the mushroom. Yeah, there's something highly symbolic and almost metaphorical there for our own life. And at the end of the day, that's what so much of spiritual iconography is, are symbols and metaphors trying to help us reconcile our own lives and the own patterns in our lives and the different masculine and feminine forces. I mean, you think about, you know, a lot of, I mean, new age teachings now, but a lot of old mystery tra traditions, it was about integrating the masculine and feminine within yourself. 
So even if mushrooms may have been picked up as kind of a symbol of that in one being that also kind of mimicked us in other ways as kind of this symbol of, of our own alchemical uniting of masculine and feminine is, is interesting to think about just the mushroom as an actual symbol for that. Um, I mean, it's, it's really fascinating stuff and it intrigues me, unfortunately, a lot more than a lot of traditional religions do. Uh, and so that's why I don't, you know, I, I don't think your work is necessarily putting down those religions, but I think it's, if anything, fleshing them out. And like I said before, making it a little more tangible. Because for me, I think of a lot of these religious texts as already highly symbolic, highly metaphorical. So being able to integrate mushrooms and other elements of nature to these stories, I think brings it down to us, brings the divinity to us. Uh, and I don't know if that's the intention of your work, but that's how I feel when I when I see those kind of pieces. Yeah, exactly. Um, and for me, I, I, I my intention is not to to be sacrilegious, although you know I, it is. <laughs> <laughs> we can poke fun at it. Come on, guys. It's we can not poke my fun intention at it. to be. It's if anything, I'm I'm trying to elevate at least my reverence towards towards religions, towards the teaching of Christ. And I think of, you know, growing up, going to church, you know, I, I don't necessarily reject um, biblical teachings. You know, I, I think that some of the teachings of Christ are are good um, and something to, you know, to respect and to, you know, teaching of love. But I see that, I see the mushroom as also a teacher. So I, I see the the connection and the symbolism between, between Christ and between the teaching of the mushroom. The mushroom is a, it's, the psychedelic experience is it's a balance it's a balancing experience i hear happy doggy there's a dog party outside nice well and so we're talking about these ideas of seeing the mushrooms as a teacher seeing christ as a teacher and i just think there's an integration here that's kind of happening on its own and your art is a symbol of that but i think there's this integration as you know, we as people have access to more information and learn about the the history of how religions that worship nature gradually became religions that more the modern Christian and Catholic religions and things all stemmed from much earlier what you would call pagan traditions. The temples or the uh, the temples or the churches were built in the same places. You see a lot of the similar stories uh, in in those different traditions. So I think naturally our society is realizing more and more that there wasn't as big a difference from those pagan religions as there is to some of the modern monotheistic religions we have now. And I think we are able to take the good, like you're saying, you take keep the good from the modern religions, but then integrate some of what these other religions had to offer too. And I think an appreciation for nature, I mean, obviously specifically here, we're talking about mushrooms, they have their own potent effects when we talk about the psychedelic mushrooms, but just in general, the appreciation of nature feels really spiritually f fulfilling. And everyone who I talk to has that same sense of when you're out in nature, it's like you're in a holy place. Now we're in the North Bay and we're lucky in that we have massive redwoods, which already makes it feel like a cathedral. Um, but then it's interesting to think about the mushrooms as like these little altars or little items of spiritual significance left all over, you know, even if they're not psychedelic. I, I always like examining some overarching themes, and that's a really interesting theme that I'm seeing. And I think a lot of people that are into mushrooms uh, that want to explore kingdom fungi do naturally have this sense that they are intimately connected with spirituality, or at least it builds into their own spirituality. And so I think your art is great at, at physically manifesting that and displaying that. Yeah, exactly. It's you know, it's it's representing um, a reverence towards these entheogens. Um, you know, it's something that has changed my life. Whether you are taking a a full psychedelic dose or whether you are microdosing, um, it's something that's it's helped me with depression um, and just sort of a centering in my life. Um, it's it's something that you have to reset with it. You have to sort of bring the needle back occasionally and to reset to your center place. And you know, there's a, 
I would say there's almost a voice that comes through from the mushroom. Um, and it's, it, you work on things. Like I say, it's, 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 you know, tripping is not a term I would use. You, you know, it's, it, it's an experience and you are doing work on yourself more than anything else. Um, and you are seeing the world with a new perspective and appreciation for nature. Well, and it sounds like having that reverence for the experience is really what differentiates it from kind of recreational to really a more, uh, what I would call maybe a more substantive use, whether it be spiritual or therapeutic. It's having a reverence for what you're taking and what the experience is. And we were saying before the show, I love your analogy of how mushrooms out in the environment or in the ecosystem are often decomposing dead matter. I mean, that's what saffirotes do. They decompose dead things. And it was funny you said, well, I feel like psychedelic mushrooms do that to all the detritus and stuff that's built up in my head. Yeah, the, the clearing of dead matter. Clearing of dead matter on the forest floor and the clearing of dead matter um, in your mind as well. Exactly. Yeah, I, I, I love that analogy. It's interesting to think that the key ingredient there is probably having a reverence for it. To actually go in and be able to deal with some of that stuff and clear out some of that stuff um, takes, takes having a reverence. And we're learning more and more too about what it is to responsibly use these things or use psilocybin containing mushrooms for what I want to say, a more productive experience for how to go into it and have a productive experience where you actually are focused on changing yourself for the better. I mean, not overthinking it, but there are certain things you can do it gives you a higher chance of having the experience have one of these beneficial outcomes and doing some productive work, like doing some real, real work with it. And I think more and more of that information is coming out. I mean, you luckily it sounds like you've come to a place where you've kind of figured out when you when you're going to have an experience how to do it in a way that lends itself to a more positive or productive outcome. You know, we're talking about spirituality. One of the big purposes of spirituality, when you hear from anthropologists, one of the huge things is to deal with the overriding realization or fear of death that humans have. Uh, and I think, you know, there's a lot of interesting parallels there. So what is some of that, what is some of that overlap and um, have mushrooms, have mushrooms help you deal with this idea of, of, you know, of death and dying? Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's case in point, um, people who are in hospice, occasionally are given in a controlled setting, um, given psychedelic mushrooms um, to sort of ease that transition. Um, and many of them say that they, they no longer fear death after taking the mushrooms. They, they connected with something that was transcendent and felt like that they were just, you know, crossing over rather than just coming to an end. Um, right. And for me, it's, it's, it's a common feeling you know i i i feel that there's something more out there i feel like it's you rather than connecting with some sort of a god figure um in the form of some sort of human persona or god human persona it you know it's it's everywhere you find it in everything you find it in, in every piece of nature um there's a piece of god mm. and now it's, it's reassuring do you think you would have had the same appreciations for nature, the same, you know, uh, ways of relating aspects of nature and mushrooms to your own personal life experience? And do you think you basically would have had a lot of these insights without the use of psych psychedelic mushrooms? Um, not me personally, no. Um, I owe a lot to the mushroom, um, and that's that. Hence, that's my reverence to yeah. it. It's changed well, my life. And again, I don't want to just encourage people to go out and do it, but it is just interesting to hear about, you know, these whole new directions people's lives take and whole new dimensions of thought that get opened up by these substances. And, you know, it's 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 undeniable. It's undeniable their power, their evocative nature, you know, the way they make us see new perspectives. And it's just something that I'm endlessly fascinated by and i guess do you think your art would have turned out the way it has without experiences with psychedelics <laughs> no it's i mean if i if i go back 20 years or so to 
how I started out making art was very different and it didn't have a psychedelic uh, twist or theme to it a long time ago. It sounds like there are indelible changes that are just have already been made to you by these experiences that continually influence you. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So we've really dove deep into the world of psychedelics and how it can change people. I hope we made enough disclaimers for people, you know, to have a measured approach when even looking at this topic. You know, I'm just always fascinated, especially by artists and how substances like this affect them. Really for anyone, how it affects their trajectory, I think is really interesting that a little substance like a mushroom can have such a big effect, such a profound effect on someone. And when you talk about an artist, that effect is immediately visual and tangible, and it's really interesting to follow. But why don't we move maybe more toward the art itself instead of uh, the psychedelic mushrooms? There's plenty of information out there on that and not okay. enough information on Michael Campbell's art and the process <laughs> and how it's made. Uh, so yeah, why don't we start with the newest piece that I think you're debuting at the Halford Gallery? Yeah, the, the show opens uh, Saturday the 18th. Um, because of the pandemic at the moment, it's a, a virtual show, but from from five to six, they will do a live Instagram cast uh, showing all the work in the show. The show is called Fantastical Beasts. And the piece that I did for that, it, it was partly inspired by the Mayan mushroom stones. Um, strange, mysterious stones made by the Mayans that have uh, sort of an anthrop anthropomorphic quality for the stem and then they all have caps on them so they all sort of wear mushroom hats but not really clear the purpose of them but obviously representing some kind of reverence towards entheogens but the piece the piece references that but the piece is titled destroying angel which is a type of poisonous mushroom in fact one of the most common ones that is mistaken for an edible and fortunately a very slow and painful death but the piece has a, it grows out of a the forest floor. It has a skull representing representing death on its stem, but its its cap is a bubble world, a dome world representing a perfect garden or a, sort of a getaway, a place a place that rises from um, the ashes in a way. And something I was reading about. Uh, just this past weekend, Easter weekend, was mushrooms um, potentially being the original basis for Phoenix symbology, which is interesting to think about, that the mushrooms would bloom into this glorious and then dissolve into ash or their spores to then rise again from that same place. So it's interesting when you said from the ashes, you know, that brings kind of this, from the ashes rises this great Heavenly, you're like tapping into uh, archetypal figures and potentially archetypal symbols that have been around for so long uh, that the mushroom does kind of rise from the ashes. I've seen the piece. It's terrific. I'm biased. I love all your work. Um, I, I own a lot of your work. <laughs> you know, recently you've been kind of making this move to some of these dome bubble cities. So why don't we talk about that a little bit? Just you know, if people don't want the visual, I mean, it's a pretty easy visual. It's a domed, perfect bubble city. But what is some of the, the imagery or thought behind that or what inspired some of that kind of work? It's influenced. So I, when I first moved to the city in 2000, I worked for a while as an architectural model maker. Mm. So playing with scale, playing with um, um, train figures and um, scenic elements to create these these small bubble worlds. And it's all influenced from sci-fi films from the 1970s. And a lot of those films had a dystopian theme. Um, and many of them were represented, um, society moved into a bubble world to separate themselves from the disaster that lived outside. So that's, mm -hmm. that's what's happening with that. The, the bubble world is this separation. You know, films like Films like Logan's Run, society has moved into a bubble. Um, Zardos, there's a separation between the Eternals and the Brutals living outside of these bubble worlds. And it couldn't be more poignant at a time where we're all living in a bubble. I mean, during this whole virus epidemic, we are all living in bubble worlds. 
That's really interesting. So you're pulling influence from like your architectural model making background, your love of 70s sci-fi, just to get some of the nitty gritty too. What is, you know, when people see your art, I know the first question is, how do you make it? Is it clay or so what are some of the materials you use and has that changed for you over time? Yeah, depending on it's, I use a lot of different materials. There's, it's a lot of mixed media, but the main uh, body of the work is made from an epoxy based clay called magic sculpt. Um, it's stuff changed my life. You mix two parts together. You've got about two hours to work with the clay and then it, um, over time, just through chemical reaction, it, it's rock hard. Um, so most of the mushrooms are sculpted from the clay, um, but then there's always little scenic elements, you know, mainly taken from um, miniature railroad um, enthusiasts, things like that. So we're using mm. miniature figures and bushes and creating landscapes inside. What are some of the favorites, maybe like themes or runs of your own work that you've done. Obviously you love it all, it's your work. What are some really cool ones that come to mind that people should uh, people should be aware of? So some of, a lot of the work um, is utilizing teacups and having little miniature worlds, having, having giant mushrooms and giant redwoods growing up out of teacups and having people um, nestled into some sort of a scene inside the teacup. And most of that is coming from References to Alice in Wonderland and um, mm. like mushroom tea and, and um, using an entheogen to change size, change shape, um, to grow bigger, grow smaller. So that's that's one aspect. But then the the other branch of the tree would be, you know, talking about the the more sacred elements of it, um, right. the ones that are referencing right. Mary or or Christ and utilizing those those statues as turning them into mushroom figures as well. So there's kind of like almost utopian world building or different world building going on centered around mushrooms. And then there's kind of the spiritual track that you take as well. Like we've already talked about blending some of the sacred classic religious iconography we have with nature. Um, so yeah, I, I just wanted people to appreciate, obviously we're talking about art, which is never going to do that medium service. But I just want people to get an idea of some of the scope and the different ways your art manifests. And it really is like powerful. Like every piece of art you make, I think the one thing people tell me is when they look at it, at first you get this initial like impression. Uh, and it's usually a really powerful one because you don't shy away from bright colors. You know, you have really beautiful sculptures all over the place. You'll have a ton of great looking mushrooms or, you know, you'll have like this powerful pop when you first see it, but then you look closer and you're able to pick up on some of the more subtle themes or tons of things going on. Obviously with the dome city, it's like a world in there. There's all kinds of funny guys walking around with briefcases and snowmen and different stuff going on. Uh, so I just want people to appreciate kind of the, the, the feeling that your work evokes and kind of the, the directions that it takes just so, just so they get a sense of it. We could also, we could also talk about, um, um, around Christmas time, um, mm. my wife and I joined forces together and we make Christmas themed pieces. Um, and the idea with that one is the, the old myth, um, about Santa Claus, um, being born of mushroom, um, how, how these Siberian shamans, um, utilize the Omni muscaria, um, the red and white, um, as a, a sacred tool and that, that connects to Santa Claus and to the reindeer, the reindeer eating the mushroom um, and flying and so on. So we do, we'll do Christmas themed mushroom pieces with all Omnina muscarias and with Santa Claus as this mushroom saint, um, who's also covered in red dots or covered in red with white dots. How could I well. leave that out? The mushroom pieces are some of my favorite. I love, I, we have a whole shrine in our house with all of your mushroom pieces and Santa Claus. It's, Fantastic. So you're also pulling a lot of themes from myths that we've been talking about. You're pulling that into your art as well. Uh, and actually to circle back on the Maya mushroom stones, those are one of my favorite pieces of ancient art of these Mayan mushroom stones. They're fantastic. So I love that. I, I had that as a question in here is whether those have influenced you. So yes, clearly they have. Your most recent piece is made with that in mind. Uh, and I actually, yes. at one point, I, I took a stone carving class just to try to make them. 
Uh, I don't think I did them justice as you did. Anyway, it's just it's just a great piece of inspiration. I love when we can pull things from the past like that, pull some of these unique myths and maybe uh, mushroom origins of things into some tangible kind of art form. I want to talk a little bit more about your path as an artist too, because now we've talked about your art. We've talked about the inspiration behind it. Um, but I think it's interesting that you've taken the route of going through galleries. There's a lot of people out in craft world doing mushroom stuff, but it's interesting that you've gone the route of galleries. So what has that been like? Was that a conscious choice? Uh, and just a little bit about your path uh, as an actual professional artist. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's challenging. It's, it's not an easy choice. Um, to be an artist, um, you you sacrifice some things, some things, um, but it's it's always been very rewarding for me. I mean, I I I, I can't imagine doing anything else. Um, this is the this is, was the path that I was supposed to be on. I'm, I'm sure of that. It is key to come to a place where you know that's what you want to do and have that level of surety. I think people know what they want to do in their heart in a lot of ways. They know they're an artist and they want to make art, but then they get in the way with their head and they start thinking too quick about how am I going to make money? Well, this people are already doing it. And it's almost like, and maybe this has been the case for you at some point, you just have to commit to this is who I know who I am. And I'm just going to commit to doing this and let the chips fall where they may. I'll, I'll either be supported or, you know, maybe I won't, but I won't find out if I don't commit try. Yeah, exactly. There's, a, there's an old saying from art school um, that you don't choose art that art chooses you mm. and in a way without, without doing art. I mean, if you are someone who is making art on a daily basis, you have a dedicated practice, um, dedicated studio time each day, you know, when you are not making art, it kind of makes you crazy. Making art is a, it's a meditation. Um, it's yeah. time alone yeah. and it's, it's figuring things out as you make it, you know, it's, it's working on yourself in a way. Building, building with your hands and also working on yourself. Yeah, well, isn't that interesting to think of art as like its own spiritual practice? Of course it would be. I mean, you're taking the things from your heart, your emotional self, the things from your head, and bringing that energy through your hands and making something with it. I mean, that's one of the most highly spiritual practices we can do, your creation. I love the fact that you are in you know, art galleries where I wouldn't expect to see a four-foot-tall Mother Mary with a mushroom dome on her head, but people love it. So has, have you been received well by kind of the art gallery community? What has been some of the response to your work? We've talked about the commitment, the investment, everything behind this. So what has been the response to your work when you do show it? Positive, really. I've been very lucky. Um, I'm in a gallery here in San Francisco and I'm showing in a gallery in LA right now. So mostly West Coast mm -hmm. um, exhibitions. But yeah, very lucky, very positive um, reception for the work. Now, are people, do you get people that are really interested in mushrooms or do people look at it as like, wow, that's just amazing art, probably a mixture of both. But do people come up, start talking like, like I did when I met you, start coming up like, hey, do you go foraging? Do you like mushrooms? Yeah, mushrooms are, they're a catalyst um, for a conversation. And in, you know, you find out that there's a lot of people that you had no idea were into mycology and like really into it and cooking mushrooms, cooking gourmet mushrooms and hunting them and into psychedelics, you know, and psychedelic experiences. So you putting the art out there in the gallery, suddenly you connect to a lot of people in ways that you, you maybe you wouldn't be able to do doing an abstract painting. Um, so it's, it's been re very rewarding that way. I've, I've met a lot of people and both in gallery and, and online as well. It's kind of like a magnet for mushroom people because whenever we don't need much but whenever mushroom people get any kind of cue it's like oh are you prepared for me to now talk your ear off about mushrooms you better be ready for this 101 now do do people i guess who are more on like the art appreciation side get the power of mushrooms or is that a chance for you to educate them on on how great mushrooms are most people hmm. get it right away um you know they, they see it they and the mushrooms that i make are they're primarily a couple of different varieties, mostly Omnina muscaria, the red and white ones, and then representing uh, Psilocybe cubensis as well. And then many of the other ones are just sort of kind of made up shapes and colors. 
most people recognize you know recognize the mushrooms and they they know what's going on they they kind of piece together the story by looking at it and actually that's a great point something i didn't want to leave out because i've had a lot of people tell me like and i tell people can you believe how realistic that Amanita looks, or can you believe how realistic that Cubensis looks? What's that process like to get the realism that you have in your sculpture? Um, yeah, sometimes it's so during mushroom season, um, my wife and I will go out foraging, hunting, sometimes with um, with you guys as well. We, you know, we live up in Northern California across the Golden Gate Bridge, and there's a lot of good hunting out there. Um, so we will go foraging and we'll find uh, bolites and Amanita muscaria. And sometimes we'll bring specimens home, not to eat, but mainly to study, to take photographs of, take you know, really microscopic photographs of the gills, to study things and to to look at the structure, to look at the gill patterns and to, to take the, the caps and make spore prints, to study the, the texture of the stem of the mushrooms and the initial egg that the omnita pops out of. You know, all these things are important to see the, the mycelium, you know, how how freaking beautiful that white, soft mycelium is on the end of a mushroom when it's mm. plucked out of the dirt. You know, it's just, it's just this beautiful white color. It feels like very soft and inviting. And I kind of asked a leading question there because I know you do go out and find specimens. I just wanted to talk about it because I think it's really cool. I think it's cool to watch you looking in the woods and keeping stuff that you're going to use for art. Like, I love seeing all the different ways why people forage and what they're looking for when they're out foraging. And I also want to bring up, you know, going into your art studio, there's kind of a wallpaper of all these different mushrooms on there that I'm assuming are some of your prompts, some of your inspirations for making pieces, some of your specimens, if you will. There's usually like taped up pieces of paper with printouts of different mushrooms that I see that I'm assuming are used to like help you model it and and get that, that realistic feel. Yeah, you're talking about um, an inspiration board. Yeah. So, um, yeah, printing out different mushrooms so I can study them as I make them. Um, and, also, and I'll also print out um, images of older pieces so I can use those as references for continuity in the work, you know, keeping a, a sense of continuity through the body of work, so referencing work from the past and work that I'm making now as well. Oh, that's really interesting. So you do consciously try to relate your body's work, like different paths you've taken. You try to kind of tie it together with each piece. Yeah, because I, I tend to be kind of scattered in when I'm creative. You know, I can go in so many different directions. So I, so I kind of have to rein it in by focusing a little bit on the work from the past and saying, okay, so these are, here's what I've done. And I like to carry certain elements over into the work in the present as well. Like for, like for example, for right now, the, the, the bubble worlds are something that I've done in the past many times. And I've mm-hmm. kind of, I left that for a while, but it's, it's such a potent image for me. Um, the idea of sort of divorcing yourself from nature and trying to, to curl up in this bubble world um, to protect yourself from what's happening outside. Um, the, uh, the devastation of the mushroom world outside and trying to reside in this utopian bubble. Um, it's something it's, that I, I want to address. It's, it's potent imagery for our times, even like minus coronavirus, just in general. Like that idea, especially with people who are sometimes a little more like uh, uh, attuned or sensitive beings to see like some of the stuff in our outside world is gnarly. And for me, I get that in looking at your bubble world. It's like, man, I want to be in there. So what are your plans in the future? What Obviously, things are affected now because galleries aren't quite the same experience. But what are some art shows coming up and some events here in the future uh, that, that you're looking at? Yeah, so I, so the, the piece we were talking about um, with the one that's called Destroying Angel is down in L.A. right now at Corey Helford Gallery, and it's in a show uh, called Fantastical Beasts, which opens on April the 18th. Um, and then I have, um, I'm connected with Modern Eden in San Francisco, and on April 23rd, they are featuring my work throughout the day. So 
online through social media. Um, they'll be showing my work and I'll, I'll be making a new piece for that as well for them to show. And I do want to throw out a couple of caveats here because this is something I've asked you before. If people want to purchase your work, they should reach out to the galleries, right? Yeah, I, I, I sell work through the galleries mainly. And people should not message you on Instagram asking for psychedelic mushrooms. <laughs> I'm sure you must get a lot of that. Yeah, no, yeah. Please don't <laughs> don't ask don't ask me for psychedelics. I'm, I'm not dealing mushrooms. I'm it, just it, I'm making art. That's all I'm doing. Unless you want to get a little magic sculpt thing of a mushroom, maybe you can send that. Something else I want to bring up is kind of exciting. Is you just moved? Your studio was located in San Rafael. And you've just had a move that I think has been pretty big for you to a new space there in Petaluma. Yeah, we are so in love with our new home and our new hometown. I know, I'm jealous of you guys. I see everything up there and it looks like idyllic. And like, I've been to Petaluma and like, what happened? They're in this like different dimension of Petaluma that just looks like it's amazing all the time. You talk about a bubble world. We live in a beautiful um, pastoral small community bubble um, and we just, we love the people. We love the vibe here. Um, it's, it's every house is like a big smile, beautiful houses, beautiful landscapes. We're happier here than we've ever been for sure. Do you think that's coming out in your work a little bit? Yeah. My, my work is greatly affected by my environment that I live in and by my mood, my outlook towards life. And right now everything is, Everything's a okay. Everything's very positive. I'm psyched that you guys got to move up there, and it's and it's kind of coming through in a good way, and affecting your work. Yeah, and the I mean the the previous piece, the Mother Mary piece that I did for for Modern Eden, had a more optimistic feel to it. It was it had you know it was Mary with this giant Amanita cap on her head, and it, it represented you know hope for me, something happy and something warm and welcoming, and the Destroying Angel has a similar feel, but it's, it's influenced by the state of affairs right now, the, you know, the, the pandemic and what that means to us and how that will influence our lives over the next year or decades or so, you know, how things will change with that and sort of living, living with that, living outside of that or trying to stay away from the world of infection. We need to start thinking about bubble worlds on top of mushrooms. So that's the only way we're going to save ourselves here. <laughs> well, I guess we kind of talked about the future for kind of your personal and creative life and professionally with galleries. Uh, so I guess I usually have a couple final thoughts for people. But first, where is the best place to pe for people to find you and find your work? The best place to find me is on social media, on Instagram. And that would be Michael Campbell Art. Just Michael Campbell art. So I know this is going to be hard for you because you like, I mean, this is hard for everyone. They always tell me it's like picking out their favorite child, but what is one of the mushrooms you really love and why? And maybe I might say that Cubensis and Amanita are off limits. What's another one that you really like and why? I, I really love um, polypores, bracket fun, fungi. Mm-hmm. Um, the so the shelf fungus that grow off the side of trees. I think that they're amazing, beautiful. I love the fact that they're sort of pushing out from the side of a tree, and one side looks, the top side looks, in some cases, looks old, um, like it's been there for you know ages and ages. But the underside is is white and fresh and fleshy in a way. Yeah, so like the Ganoderma is like those artist conks or like those big. Old, it almost looked like a burl coming off the tree. Mm -hmm, exactly, yeah. And turkey tails, the um, the beauty of the of the different colors that follow the contour of the shape of the turkey tail. They're they're always intriguing too, just because we were always talking about mushrooms being ephemeral, and those are mushrooms which seem like they aren't, especially some of those big artist conks and different Ganoderma that can, and agaricons and things that can be like decades old. Um, they're just, they are, they are absolutely fascinating. And then a big question, it's not, not always an easy question, but what is the lasting impact that you hope your work has or your work makes on the world? Well, I would, I would hope that 
the work that I'm making um, invites people into the mushroom world, um, makes them more inquisitive about what it is that people love about mycology, um, studying the mushrooms, um, eating the mushrooms, um, using mushrooms as medicinals, you know, like, like lion's mane and reishi and turkey tails, but also mainly our relationship to the natural world. The mushroom is, is that connection for me. Um, it's, it, it has elevated the natural world into a place of reverence for me. And that's what I, I hope would carry across in the work to other people as well. well. I know that's how it carries across to myself. I encourage people to go check out your work. Uh, obviously, go support the galleries that you're at, but go follow you on social media and really let yourself step into that world and view it through the eyes of Michael Campbell because it's really interesting and really offers a lot of new perspectives. So, MC, thank you for making the time. I know you have a busy schedule and you got a lot going on. I know you're kind of zoomed out at this point. So thank you for making the time and coming on and having a chat. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me.